So it is 7.33 p.m. on Tuesday, June 1st, 2021. I'd like to call this meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals to order. Uh, good evening, my name is Christian Klein. I'd like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Here. Stephen Reblack. Here. And Sean O'Rourke, I know is traveling this evening, won't be able to join us. And Mr. Ford is running a few minutes late, but he'll be joining us en route. Um, uh, officials here on behalf of the town, uh, Rick Valarelli. Here. And Vincent Lee. Here. And Kelly Lanema. Here. Thank you all for being here. Um, uh, outside consultants for the board, uh, Paul Haverty. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Paul. Um, uh, Marty Nova from Beta Group. Mr. Chair, I am here also with uh, Bill McGrath, um, PE Civil, um, Laura Krause, and Tyler DeRuder. Oh, wonderful. You're welcome to join us. And then appearing um, <coughs> applicant for 1165R Mass Ave, uh, Mary Winstanley O'Connor. I'm here, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you. And I believe I saw five others from um, your various consultants on board as well. Yes, if you want, uh, Daniel St. Clair, Julia yeah. Myrak, Paul Boucher, Kyle Zick, the landscape architect, Brian Zamolka, uh, Randy Marin, Joel Bargman, and Andy Platt are also on the call. Oh, wonderful. And Dan Wells is supposed to be on the call. Okay. I'm here. Okay, thanks, Dan. Mary, Bill Guanaro is also uh, supposed to be on the call. He's from ICO Energy. Okay. He just joined. Oh, great. Right. Well, good evening. Um, this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020. The order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom app with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, other participants are participating by computer audio or telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask that you please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. Um, so I know that there was a, a very large distribution of materials I know at the very end of the day, and I don't know if all those have made it onto um, the agenda for this evening or not. Um, Vin, were you able to access those documents? Yes, I think they should all be on there. Oh, perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so the first item on our agenda this evening would be the approval of the final decision on 34 Marathon Street. But one of the people who needs to vote on those is Aaron Ford, who is not quite here yet. Um, Pat, do you think we should go ahead and vote without him? Or do you think we should hold it and do it at the end? 
I think we should hold it and do it to the end. I, I, I've looked at the participants lists and I did not see anyone associated with that application on it. We might want to inquire and, and see, but if, if there's no one here to listen to it, there's no reason to take, not to do it, wait till the end and do it then. Thank you. Is there anyone on the call this evening specifically for 34 Marathon Street? You go ahead and raise your hand or unmute yourself and let yourself be known. Seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and table that to the close. Okay. So that brings us up to the second item on our agenda, which is the comprehensive, the continuation of the comprehensive permit hearing for 1165R Massachusetts Avenue. Um, before we begin, here's some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. This evening's discussion will focus on revised materials from the applicant and from the consulting engineers. We will open with a presentation by the applicant followed by questions from the board. After the board, members of the public will be provide, invited to provide their questions and comments. So, um, with that in mind, Ms. O'Connor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, members of the board. Uh, first, on behalf of the applicant, I wanna thank the members of the board for their, the time that's been spent on this application and their expertise. And I particularly, on behalf of my client and myself, wanna thank Beta for their work, Marty and her team, and how quickly they turned around the most recent comments. We're very appreciative of that, and we thank them. Um, this evening, we have, uh, have everyone on the call in case the board has any questions based on the materials submitted. We have uh, provided updated architectural and site civil plans for the 124 unit uh, development. Uh, I believe, uh, and Beta can correct me if I'm, I misspeak, that the wetlands uh, issues have been resolved. Uh, we have addressed the guest parking issues that were brought up at the last meeting. Uh, I believe the landscaping questions have been resolved. And I would suggest to you that the traffic impact issues as well as the neighbor, neighborhood concerns have been addressed by my client. Uh, I have also, Attorney DuPont, provided the information that you had requested concerning uh, who has the ability to tow on Ryder Street. And I've provided a letter as to that information and the status of that after looking at the statute. I um, saw that, uh, thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Um, uh, we do have someone from ICO Engineering and Energy on the call to address the utility pole and uh, what would be appropriate for installation on the utility pole in the easement. And uh, Paul Boucher of Jones Lang LaSalle will at the end go over the direct preliminary construction management plan that has been put together. So rather than me restate things, I thought if the board would prefer we could respond to any um, questions or concerns. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, is there anyone from the board who has questions they'd like to start off with? Mr. Chairman? <clears throat> Mr. Hamlin? Um, I, I, I don't immediately, well, I have one minor one, but this is more importantly, um, it seems to me it would be helpful for us to uh, hear from Marta's team. And I think Susan Chapnick is here just to basically have them either agree with Ms. O'Connor or uh, let us know whether there's anything residual that causes them any, any concern or that they think, even if it doesn't cause them concern that we should pay special attention to. Thank you, that is well taken. Um, so Ms. Nover, is there other comments from your team? Sure, um, I think um, I'll le let the three speak. Um, I'll start with Bill, Bill Rath, um on the civil stormwater um, topic. Thanks, Marty. Again, Bill McGrath with Beta. Um, I think at the last meeting we had noted that um, prior to the 124 unit revision, uh, I think all of the comments on stormwater had, had been addressed other than just some final coordination on the plans. Um, 
And I, I think the last thing with the revision to the 124 units is just the, how the drainage is gonna be handled in the new surface parking that's next to the garage. is there that used to be the garage and then that's um, from there uh, from that water quality unit obviously it's treated and then it goes into it eventually discharges into Millbrook but you'll see it on the uh, on the plans that we submitted this afternoon all right thanks okay thank you both uh, Ms. Krause sure so um, most of our all of our comments have essentially been addressed we did recommend that a um, complete set of revised plans get uh, submitted, which it sounds like they were. So we'll take a look at those just to confirm that everything was carried over. Um, but the, all of our remaining comments were poten potential recommended conditions. Um, and that's where our, our comment letter essentially left off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was reading, reading through that today. Thank you. Um, and then um, Tyler Deruda. Hi, right, thank you, Tyler Deruda with Beta Group, uh, traffic engineer. Um, so we reviewed um, the applicant's uh, uh, shared. Uh, what am I thinking of? Uh, parking memorandum that was sent over last week. Uh, we basically have found the letter to be reasonable, um, but we've offered four comments for consideration of the board. Again, mostly just. Um, conditions type comments uh, for consideration revolving uh, around shared parking. Um, so while there is guest parking available, much of it relies on a shared parking scenario where uh, residents and guests and work bar may be using the same spaces over the course of the day um, and just uh, developing a parking plan to kind of manage that and how parking will be utilized throughout the day. But that was that was pretty much it. Great, thank you. Anything further from Beta? No, uh, no, no, Mr. Jim. Thank you all very much. Um, and then oh, Mr. Ford has joined us. Excellent. Um, I think the other question was whether um, was Ms. Chapnick on the line? I, I, excuse me, I am. If you if you wouldn't mind, um, just in regards to, you know, obviously the stormwater and wetlands, if there were any further outstanding questions that uh, the Conservation Commission had at this time. Um, there are no outstanding questions at this time. I, I will say that um, the response, the May 27th, I believe, response letter on the wetlands resource area and the updated planting plans have not been reviewed by the commission yet. Um, just due the, to the timing of our next public meeting, which is this Thursday. So though they, to me, um, look acceptable, as Beta said, um, we do reserve that, that we might have some, you know, a few questions or comments um that come up on thursday when we're going to discuss these updated documents um so i, I don't see anything you know serious but i i can't say there won't be any comments okay um, so Understood. yes and and we will um the commission is planning on if we do have comments on generating a letter and getting that out to you and the applicant and beta quickly because I understand that we want to all um, be efficient about this and, and wrap it up. I will also say that the commission would look forward to working with Beta on, um, on proposed uh, permit conditions 
I, I think Mr. Hanlon had, had said in the past, and it was a good observation, that it would be more efficient if we work together rather than um, submitting separate um, proposed conditions that then have to be meshed together. I, I don't know if that's, that's something that uh, Chairman Klein, you want to endorse and, and we should we should go forward in that regard or, or how should we proceed? I, I think absolutely. Um, I think it would certainly assist in the, in the creation of, of, of those um, potential conditions. Sounds good. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Revelak. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had uh, a brief question uh, regarding uh, Mr. Zamolka's memo from May 26th. Um, I'll catch it. <laughs> All right. Uh, the May 26th memo, it's specifically the section on additional overnight parking accommodations. Uh, so it sounds like, uh, if I'm if I'm understanding standing it correctly. Uh, guests at the uh, at the or overnight guests would be able to request an overnight um, waiver to park in front of park on the street on Mass Ave in front of the Hyundai dealership, um, and that there would be so many you know each residential un, uh, unit would be allotted so many you know waivers. I just wanted to verify that this was. Um, or I just wanted to make sure that uh, you this was verified with the Arlington Police Department. So this was taken directly from um, the regulation, Arlington regulation. So there's uh, and there's specific instructions on the Arlington website to to request this. So you have to reach out to the police department. Uh, Mr. Rebelak, we did receive a memo from Corey Rateau, Officer Rateau, uh, confirming all of that. Beautiful. That's that's exactly what I was hoping to hear. Thank you. You're welcome. Nothing further, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, and just, just so everyone knows, um, we did submit, um, I had written a, a letter and um, <clears throat> Ms. Linema sub submitted it to the various uh, town commissions boards and departments last week requesting that um, if there are any final comments from those groups um, who wish to inform the decision of the board, if they could please submit uh, a letter to the board by a week from today. So we expect to have those um, in hopefully over the course of this week, if not the beginning of next week. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Please. Um, so I have a question to um, regarding Mr. Zamolka's letter, and it's just because I want to understand the graph a little bit more uh, in detail. So in reference to the overnight parking, it said that work bar has uh, 10 contracted spaces. Is that accurate? That's correct. So, and, and is that presently what happens that there are 10 cars there overnight? Um, we have done a, you know, we did the uh, large study. Um, and when we counted the cars at night, there was less than 10. I believe there was only about three or four. And so in the event that there were fewer than 10, then those spaces would be available for guest parking? Those are uh, reserved for work bar only. Okay. Um, and then similarly, moving from the overnight to the weekday, midday, um, just to understand how these are categorized. So it says calculated required work bar spaces 17 and contracted uh, spaces 40. So again, that's what is somehow in writing versus what you've observed. Yeah, so the, the, what we observed and what we calculated, uh, you know, based on the study that we did, there were 17 spaces that would be required based on the utilization. However, contractually, 40 spaces will be reserved for the work bar tenants. And so, and I can understand that there might be some difficulties. So those spaces, if not being used by work bar, would not ever be available for guests. Correct. Okay. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um. 
so I did have a few questions. Um, so in I didn't get a chance to get through um, all the packets that came out today. Um, but the layout plan has reference to references to several different bench types, um, like several different pavers, several different planters, and some other um, site amenities. Are those detailed in the set? Randy, can you answer that? I actually think that'd be Kyle. Yeah, that'd be me. Um, we have details for those, and um, I don't believe those were part of the package. We had the just the layout and the planting and the mm -hmm. swale detailing. We didn't have any of the site furnishings. Do you, but do you have information on those that you could provide? We do. Okay. Um, I had just wanted to just take a look at the benches to sort of see what style benches they are. Um, and see if they have armrests or not. Um, check with the pavers to make sure that the uh, the surfaces that would have the pavers um, would meet the requirements uh, for accessibility. Um, and then uh, look for the details on the railings and then also just on the bike racks to make sure that the bike racks comply with the, the town's um, zoning bylaws in regards to bicycle storage. We can provide all that. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, and then the only other question I had is there's a, uh, on the site lighting. Um, so it appears that all the site, all the site lighting, there's two different fixtures. There's a building wall mount fixture that's being used. And there's a pole mount fixture. The detail for the pole mount indicates that it's uh, to be set 30 inches back from the curb. But looking at the plans, it looks in most locations, it's closer than 30 inches to the curb. So I just wanted to um, just confirm on that as to, just to make sure that there is sufficient separation between the curb and the pole base. Yeah, and I, and I think we can try to provide um, sufficient protection where there is room, but I think in, in other areas, we might need to provide a raised, uh, um, a raised foundation as like a protection, almost as like a bollard to protect that pole. You know, with I, I guess w within areas where we can't meet that setback, that thirty-inch setback. Um, and then my my final question gets back to my my favorite topic of the telephone pole in the middle of the right away. Um, so I was over there uh, again today, taking a look at the at the pole. Um, there are bits of a uh, broken headlight shell. Um, on the ground next to the pole. Um, so it's obviously been been struck recently. Um, and in the time it took me to walk down, turn around and come back, uh, there were there was already a car parked um, in the right of way against the pole. Um, and if, if I may be you know overthinking this, but I I, I have I still have big reservations about this telephone pole in the right of way, and I understand the the difficulties involved in trying to relocate it. Um, if it has to stay, uh, I would definitely be interested in you know how we can create an environment where you know cars are not driving directly at it, and where it is you know where we disincentivize trying to park against it so that it is partly blocking, you know, what is intended to be a right of way that now doesn't receive very much traffic, but in the future could receive considerably more traffic. Um, <clears throat> and so I know you had submitted um, today a couple of uh, sort of wrap style um, protections, uh, one that was rigid, one that's a little softer that would wrap around the base of the pole, that will be bright colored. Um, I did want to ask if you'd considered um, extending a curb out around the pole um, or some kind of a um, some kind of a barrier that would, if a car was traveling towards it, it would be the car would be deflected away from the pole rather than um, impacting the pole head on. Randy, can you answer that as to those two suggestions? Actually, I think we want the folks from ICO to, to help with that one. 
Yeah, yeah, I, this I is Bill Gwinnagher from ICO Energy and Engineering, and um, we're working with the developer as a utility expert in helping kind of uh, them navigate the process in dealing with electric and gas. Uh, but over uh, the course of our work, we, we definitely deal with Verizon quite a bit. In this um, case, in this situation, Verizon sets the poles. They are joint owned between Verizon and Eversource. So ultimately, the way they divvy them up in Arlington, um, Verizon is responsible for uh, maintaining the poles and, and setting new poles if necessary. So our um, stance was to take it up with Verizon and ask for their input on how they would best treat a pole that's in a, a situation of high traffic. Um, it's, um, we wanted to at least present something that was reasonable in, in a kind of a simple um, solution to highlight the pole, to make it more obvious. Um, but um, what we would do with that idea is certainly we would have to approach Verizon with that concept and see if they would buy into it. Um, but in conjunction with that, they may have some suggestions of, on their own where they've dealt with this kind of situation time and time again. So um, we would open that dialogue with, with Verizon for their input. Um, I will uh, suggest or, or say state that that dialogue has not happened yet, um, but, but that's you know, what we would suggest doing in, in a path forward mm -hmm. to, to look to remedy the situation. But as far as uh, curbing and things like that, that it doesn't really kind of settle in, in our realm of responsibility or, or service. Um, so dealing with the utilities is kind of what we would present and, and, and have that dialogue as far as considering uh, altering the curb line or, or anything like that. Yeah, um, that has across our desk and we haven't had those conversations with the developer. Okay. And if I may, uh, Chairman Klein, yes, we, we've had a lot of people look at this from different angles and we have Bill here who's uh, who's been great in helping us um, work through the uh, opaque infrastructure that is uh, the utility world. Um, and uh, we, we've made some great strides. We've actually tried many times to have this conversation with Verizon and just have not gotten there. But um, and we've looked at a number of these issue, number of these ideas, curbing, bollards, uh, other protective, you know, crush proof uh, things that would, uh, would uh, you, know, you know, absorb the impact without affecting the pole. Um, and, you know, the, the speeds are, are not excessive here, although people might at times drive faster than they should. One way that we've tried to address the speed issue um, in working with uh, one of the neighbors is to put in a, um, a speed bump that would slow traffic down. And, and I, we think that'll be an effective tool. We don't think adding uh, curbs and bollards will do anything to reduce the danger to, to drivers, which is real and to pedestrians, if they're out there, they shouldn't be out there, but if they are, it, cause that'll further narrow the, the, the private way and that private way has access rights to the neighbors and we're trying uh, our darndest to, um, uh, to respect those and um, bending over backwards to not impede those. And I think frankly, if we start building stuff that, that uh, reduce the roadway, it would not work to that end. So, um, you know, in the interest of trying to uh, slow the traffic down. We're using other means to do that in the interest of protecting the pole. Um, uh, assuming the horizon signs off on this, I can't imagine they won't because we're protecting their property, putting on some reflective uh, protective coating that makes it far more visible um, will certainly go a long way. And, um, and otherwise mitigating the, the amount of cars that go past it, which we've talked about at great length in front of this board. So, um, I think we're, we've looked at this range of um, approaches and we've kind of come, come to this idea that um, let's try not to further choke down the, the travel path um, and, but make it far more visible and slow traffic down. Okay. Thank you. And, and I would also, you'll, you'll see later that we are, we are proposing no parking signs mm -hmm. on the um, Myrec 
Hyundai side of the private way as a reminder to people to not park there. Great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Are there further questions from the board at this time? Seeing none. Um, I would <clears throat> this stage, I will go ahead and um, Open the meeting for uh, for public comment. Um, so just quickly, um, the opening of public comment period for the revised uh, information on the proposed project. Public questions and comments will be taken as they relate to the matter at hand and to be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. To provide for an orderly flow to the meeting and to allow the inclusion of many voices, the chair asks individual speakers to limit their comments. To around five minutes and encourages them to use their time to provide comment related to the indicated topics. Additional time will be provided at the discretion of the chair to provide time for questions to be fully addressed. Chair encourages the public to provide written comment to be reviewed by the board and included in the record. This is especially true if you have specific recommendations in regards to the project. Procedure for requesting to speak are the same as for previous hearings. Please select the raise hand button on the comments tab on Zoom or dial star nine on your phone to indicate if you'd like to speak. When called upon, please identify yourself by name and address. You'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps us generate accurate minutes. Once all public questions and comments have been addressed, the public comment period will be closed for this session of the hearing. And the board and staff will do our best to show documents being discussed. If you'd like a specific document to be pulled up during your comments, please do ask us to do so. Um, Mr. Anessi. Good evening, folks. <clears throat> what I'd like to do uh, at the outset is uh, thank the Myrak family for having met with me <clears throat> on at least three occasions. Uh, they certainly have uh, gone out of their way to present the project to me so that I could understand what was being proposed, uh, how the traffic uh, was going to flow and the like. And I, I'll state for the record that I don't object to the project itself. However, uh, I do have issues with respect to the right of way. Uh, I'm uh, uh, 1171 Mass Ave, just on the left-hand side as you come in the right of way. My right of way was created in 1912. It's gone through a lot of transformations over the years, okay, and that's fine. Uh, I've heard comments from uh, some of the folks on the applicant side uh, uh, and with respect to you, Christian, as well, uh, with regard to having some sort of buffer or some sort of curbing around the pole that might protect the pole. Well, I think the emphasis ought to be on what's going to protect my property. Uh, Christian, if you look at the photos that I submitted back in January, and you may not have those handy, I don't know, uh, but the photos I submitted back in January show how my curbing was beaten up over the years. Many times I had to have the curbing replaced. And quite frankly, the, uh, the problems with the curbing did not occur because of traffic coming into uh, the, uh, the property, but rather uh, property coming out, uh, 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 traffic coming out of the property, particularly traffic coming from behind the Myra Cayande property, where you make the turn and you come around. I would have trucks get stuck on my property on my sidewalk, uh, uh, causing me to have to replace my sidewalk on many occasions. I finally put up uh, I put up a, a yellow pole years ago to protect my fence uh, and that worked okay because uh, vehicles were back, back, uh, backing into my fence. I also put up a pole in front of my property. As you, uh, if you, if you had the photos, you could see that, a yellow pole. And that yellow pole basically 
uh, uh, prevented vehicles coming from around behind the Myra Kayendi property from making the turn and coming up on my sidewalk and potentially hitting my building. Uh, I think the problem with respect to putting curbing around the telephone pole or anything else around the telephone pole is that it's going to have a tendency to redirect the traffic that would be, uh, come closer to the telephone pole to my property and my right of way. And it's important to note that the entranceway for the Myrak Hyundai property is like maybe 20 to 25 feet away from the entranceway to my property. I went out there today and I, I submitted a memo to the board, which I hope that you did perceive, where I made some mm -hmm. comments uh, about, the, uh, about the right of way. I went out there today, uh, by the way, in that, in that memo, I indicated that I paced off the distance from my curbing to the pole and it was 15 feet. Well, I don't think it's 15 feet. I think I was overly generous. I think it's closer to maybe 13 feet, uh, if, if that. So we're talking now about uh, a 13 foot way, which supposedly started out as a 20 foot right of way. The telephone, I don't blame the Myrax for the telephone pole, it's not their fault, okay? Uh, the telephone pole uh, basically has cut into that right of way. So what am I left with at this point? I'm left with a situation where there's going to be a 13 foot width between the telephone pole and my curb. You're going to have the continued traffic from my Hyundai coming from around the back of the, uh, the Hyundai property up into the Hyundai property. That's how their cars come up to the Hyundai property. They, they don't come up from Mass Ave. They come up from behind the Hyundai property. I'm going to have that problem continuing. And that, by the way, is in and out traffic. Uh, nobody can stop uh, my, uh, Eddie Myrak's uh, family from using that property. They have vested rights to use that property in and out as I do with respect to my property. Now my property of course has limited traffic. I've got an office, I've got two residential units upstairs and I don't generate very much traffic. What I'm concerned about, uh, and again, I don't object to the project. What I'm concerned about is I'm concerned about construction vehicles, Lord knows, how big coming down that 13 foot wide way, uh, accessing the property, maybe 30, 40, 50 feet away from my property to work on the property that's going to be demolished and reconstructed. I've got a problem with that, okay, in terms of construction vehicles doing that for safety reasons, for damage to my property as well. And I think I'm looking for some help, okay? Uh, I mean, I could say to everybody, look, I'm gonna contest this thing. I'm gonna go, go to the land court. I'm gonna argue that it's an overburdening of my right of way, which I, I think it is, but I'm not gonna do that. That's not where I'm coming from. Where I'm coming from is I want the project to go forward, but I need some help in terms of protecting my property uh, with respect to what is now going to be a 13 foot wide way. And I know there's been discussion about reflectors on the pole, uh, about lighting, about a lot of other things. Uh, whether that's gonna do the trick, I just don't know. And quite frankly, I can't come up with an idea that helps in terms of uh, what could be done about the pole because whatever I come up with would be a lessening, a further lessening of the width of the way. So I'm at your mercy in many ways, uh, folks on the zoning board. And I'm asking for some help in terms of coming up with uh, a solution of some kind that's going to protect my property, that's going to protect the safety of the people entering my property. And by the way, Mr. Hanlon, I do have a Marine Corps parking only sign in my parking lot but I'm not sure that that's going to deter any parking in my parking lot. I, I'm, I'm not really talking about parking in the parking lot at this point, as much as I am the width of the way. So I'm at your mercy. Uh, I would, 
uh, Mr. Hudson, I did find those photos. Did you want me to show those? Yes, would you do that, please? Thank you. Sure. Uh, Chairman Klein, could I respond? Please. Um, uh, Attorney Anessi is a friend and I we appreciate his comments. Um, we're not altering what is there. Um, I will say that his concerns are not with respect to, by way of the traffic, are not with respect to the uh, project that we're talking about tonight. They are exclusively related to the uh, Myrac dealership next door and their use or maybe abuse of the uh, right of way. Um, and we are going to put signs that will say uh, no parking in, in the right of way and we perhaps could even say uh, violators will be towed. Uh, we have talked to attorney Anessi about uh, putting up signs for him that say no parking in his lot. And as to the issue of construction vehicles, uh, Paul Boucher of Jones, uh, Lasang and Lal will, uh, will talk about what we propose by way of the construction vehicles. So the Thank concern it, it actually, there's less of an impact um, due to this project because only vehicles would be coming into the project and the work bar people will also be only be coming in Mass Ave and exiting Ryder Street. So the real issue is the, the other um, party, the Myrac dealership that has vested rights to use that right of way. And there's no way we can control that. And, and the problem with that is that uh, there's still in and out traffic coming from Myrac Hyundai which will be competing with the traffic coming in. Again, I, <laughs> I need to keep saying this. I'm not opposed to the project. I would like to see if there's some sort of a solution uh, so that my property is protected and the safety of people. Uh, I pull out of my parking lot, you, that photo that you see right now, mm -hmm. I pulled out of that parking lot. And you're right, Mary, vehicles coming from behind my Rakayande have whipped around the bend and come within inches of my car, okay? And, and even vehicles on the other side of the pole come out from the Myrac Handy property with the same problem. And by the way, I came in tonight, I'm in the office uh, this evening for this Zoom, and there was a car parked in front of the uh, utility pole, which uh, even further lessens the width of the way. So I think I've said as much as I need to. Can I just say something really quickly? Um, it, it's it's a matter, of course, I think, for every project that we do uh, as a good neighbor to do a um, photographic um, documentation of the conditions before we start with abutters um, and where we, we have such close, um, you know, quarters. And we, we would do that here. We will do that here. Um, and that will give everybody a very clear understanding of what condition um, are, are in place before we start. And if, if we damage something, we will fix it. Uh, you know, so um, I, I, we can't necessarily fix what other people do, but we will be responsible for what we do. Um, and it will be left in better condition than it is before. That driveway will be repaved as a part of this work. It has to be because new utility lines are gonna be dug, trenched through there. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the process will be, you know, like any construction process, it will have some aches and pains to get through and we'll, we'll be a, as good a partner as we can possibly be and we'll be there to answer your questions. And when we're done, we'll leave it as, as good or better condition as when we came. I, I, I do appreciate that. And uh, of course, what I was talking about earlier is directed uh, toward ongoing uh, traffic, okay? What perhaps could uh, uh, be proposed in terms of dealing with that issue uh, that I've raised, okay? With respect to the fact that uh, we can't do, I, I don't think we can do anything around that pole to, uh, to basically protect the pole because when you protect the pole, you're not protecting my property. That's the bottom line. Thank you, I think the speed bump will go a long way once the work okay. is done and the repaving is is there. It will help protect. It'll help uh, reduce that speed issue of cars coming around the corner, whomever they are. Thank you. Um, so move on, Mr. T. Here's our cupcakes. 
Hey, this is uh, Alexander T of Two Rider Street. I just got a delivery of cupcakes, so thank you. Um, uh, so I have a three-part question. Uh, the, the first part is directed at the uh, applicant. And I, I'm kind of curious, I, there've been so many moving pieces on the parking uh, aspect of this that I kind of want to understand specifically based on the number of units and the requirements of work bar, how many spaces below the zoning ordinance are we? Like, is it a eight space delta or is it a 20 space delta between kind of uh, what's being requested in that waiver? My second part of my question is directed back at beta. Earlier on this call, it was mentioned that uh, shared parking introduces some level of risk and, and to, to be able to manage that. I'm asking it on previous instances, uh, how much risk could we be assuming here? Uh, and then thirdly, back to the applicant after that, um, just what other means have been explored for finding additional spaces? Um, I noticed on the, the last meeting, you had actually pulled the facade of the building back uh, 24 or, or, or a certain amount to get, provide more space from the boundary. Has it been explored to kind of add that second tier parking back in, which accounts for eight spaces, as, as that would still allow you the, uh, the privacy setback for the residential units, but maybe it's not as important for the spaces themselves. Uh, and then I also just wanted to kind of uh, follow up is if there was any more developments in terms of the, the, the lease agreement as, you know, there was a lot of concern on the last call uh, just about a, the, the, the uh, kind of the, the sensitivity around eviction and, and how we were gonna actually enforce that standard. Thank you. Thank you. If I could just, um, if you could just further elaborate on your question about risk. Um, yeah, yeah. So again, I think we we all know it, the, that uh, the the you know Brian's team and the, the applicant have done a lot of uh, observational studies, um, and so again, I think they have good data that they're working off of. And if that data holds true, then there's probably a zero risk. Um, but again, I think there are a lot of assumptions baked into that. And, and is this property going to behave in the same way as those other properties? Possibly, but in the case that it's not, that's what I'm kind of trying to understand. If how much risk is there in terms of going to be overflow onto our street for parking? Very good. Thank you very much. Um, so starting with the, the question about the number of parking spaces. Um, uh, I would defer to uh, Mr. Bargman and uh, Mr. Zamolka on those. Wonderful. So uh, can you repeat the question? I, I apologize. Nope, not at all. Um, <clears throat> so the question was, Sort of re relative to the Arlington's parking requirements, um, how many parking spaces, the number of parking spaces that are proposed for this site, is it even with the, the number that's required or is it a lower number? And if it's a lower number, what what is that difference? I believe that's actually a question that Joel could probably answer um, or Daniel. Yeah, think, so, so the, uh, the total number of parking spaces that, that we have is 128 spaces. Um, zoning would dictate one and a half spaces per unit and there'd be 186 spaces. No, 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 it's, excuse me, it's 160. Uh, 160 parking spaces would be required for the 124 unit scheme and we are proposing 128. I'm sorry, I was looking at the bicycle line, my bad. <laughs> my bad, my bad. So 160 to 120, my bad. Okay, so we Thank are- Thank you, Mary. <laughs> so we are 32 below that number, below the one and a half, essentially. Right. And um, Connor, I think you had said before that I think eight of the spaces will be compact spaces, is that correct? Yes, eight of them will be compact spaces which is well below what's permitted by the bylaw. Correct, thank you. Um, and then there was a question about, um, I guess that sort of the confidence in the data and the, the recommended number of parking spaces, how confident, you know, so what's the, the confidence level that, that, that we are providing the right number of spaces and what happens if that number proves to be undercounting what, we, what is required? I think Mr. Zamolka will tell you he's very confident in his data. So, Brian? Yeah, I mean, the, the data is based on, you know, national studies, and that's the way we do traffic engineering. Those are the standards. So how am I, how confident I am? It, it's, it's not how I feel. It's what the data, you know, mm -hmm. presents. Um, I think the, the question was actually directed towards beta. I don't know if 
Tyler had anything more. I would agree with Mr. Zamolka. Um, you know, they've, they've counted the three additional sites that are within proximity of the town of Arlington. Um, and they're all similar uh, residential sites. Um, you know, we've reviewed the data and it seems reasonable, ba reasonable based on um, their, their evaluation. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the third question was in regards to uh, whether <clears throat> the ability to create additional parking spaces um, and specifically looking at the, uh, the portion of the building that was removed at the, on the southern end of the property to, uh, and then having the parking that's exposed at ground level, was there consideration of extending the, the second floor parking over that, uh, that area? And I guess as a corollary question, would that be something that would be possible in the future should additional parking be required? I think to, to build parking, <clears throat> uh, structured parking, and not be able to offset that with the revenue of additional units built above it would create an uneconomic situation. So building eight spaces, you know, sticking up in the air. And, and I think aesthetically, it would not be a great solution, certainly not one that I think our team would be a proponent of. So I think it's both aesthetically not uh, the, the right solution and um, it is economically just not a feasible uh, solution. Um, and then the, the last question, uh, Ms. O'Connor, I believe you have some information in this regard, is sure. with the question about the, the lease and the ability to enforce parking regulations through the lease. Sure, based on the comments from the abutters and attorney Haverty at the last meeting, I did look at the issue as to whether a fine could be levied pre, uh, against uh, those tenants in the affordable units, which it could not be without uh, the permission of HUD. So um, after much discussion, uh, the route that I think we're going to go is that if um, it is reported that someone has violated the parking situation, they'll get a warning the first time, and then they will be advised that their lease will not be renewed. So we won't evict them, but when their lease comes up, they will not be renewed. Um, um, Mr. Chair, this is this is Alex again. If, yep. Could I ask one quick follow up, please? Uh, so, so if I'm understanding the math correctly, again, we're about 30 ish spots below if it was just a residential unit. I, I could think that what the, my question for beta was, it's not just a residential unit. It is also a it's a mixed use development, right, where we have work bar and there are a certain number of spaces allocated for that. And so, again, I, I think we're making we're asking the applicant is asking for accommodations from the town to go with fewer spaces on the residential side, but there's also added risk from having it be a mixed use property. And, and that, that's the part that I wanted better clarity from beta on in terms of the shared use aspect of this. How likely is it gonna be that everything kind of works uh, so cleanly where, where you know people leave their residence on time and time for work bar to show up? Because I think that's when we're gonna see the overflow during those peak parking times. Uh, and again, people are not going to start to come out and move their car when a space opens up. Sure. Thank you, Tyler DeRuta here from Beta. Please. I would just say that that is the basis of our uh, follow-up comment to Mr. Zamolko's letter. Um, if you have reviewed it, it is, I believe, comment number three. And it basically states just that um, for the work bar and the residential and the guest parking to work out. There's some number of residential spaces that need to be empty throughout the day as they observed at their similar sites um, as those folks go off to work. Um, if those spaces are not empty, then there could be overflow from the work bar. And so the comment basically outlines, um, you know, defining a parking management program for the site that says, you know, whether um, these uh, leased spaces are required to be uh, not there during the day or however they decide to have that work out. Um, unfortunately, that's not for me to tell the management company what to do, um, but it is something that we would request that they accommodate. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, the, what we're talking about 
is, as I, I think, uh, points three and four of Tyler's letter of May 27th. Um, and it may be that, that this is a time where uh, the applicant really ought to, I mean, I'm sure they were intending to address those two questions anyway, but this may be a time for them to look at them and give us an idea of what they would plan. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. <clears throat> uh, have any plans been developed as of yet as to parking management, Mr. Connor? Uh, I would defer to Brian. Any plans? I, I would actually defer to Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, man on the spot here. So, uh, I, I would just at, you know, ask people to think about this for a minute. We're going to have a, you know, professionally managed community and uh, the success of our project and the ongoing operational success will be very uh, contingent upon our management company being sure that these rules are obeyed by, you know, the, we, we don't want a situation where there's a bunch of work par parkers uh, ex overextending their welcome and staying too late and then the residents not being able to park. And likewise, we don't want to have our residents not uh, re recognizing the spaces that are for the work bar folks. We submitted plans today that designate very specifically which spaces those are. We shaded them, the 40 spaces that will be uh, available during weekdays and the 10 spaces, which is a subset of those 40, that will be available in the evenings and the weekends. We plan to assign spaces by number when that when they are a reserved space and to actively manage them. And um, we'd be happy to put together a parking management plan if that makes people feel better, but that's just the normal course of what a good operator does. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I, I am certain that that is something that we will follow through on and if it, if it brings people a level of comfort for us to put that together as a condition of the project going forward, we'd be happy to do that. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so essentially the, like the individual parking spaces would be numbered and they may have particular signage that indicate you know, this space reserved for work bar only during such and such hours. Um, yes. And then, okay. And, and that's all shown on the drawings that we submitted exactly which spaces those are, the actual numbering scheme. So, um, it, you know, it, it'll be very clear if a car is not abiding by those when there's, if they're parked in a, um, in a reserve space, if they're not the right car in that right space, because mm -hmm. re reserve spaces will be assigned, then it'll be very clear if it's not working. And believe me, it will be, it, we will be solving it before anybody does because we need to for the success of the ongoing operations of the project. Got it. Yeah, no, just to, due to the late arrival of the drawings today, we haven't had a chance to dig, dig too, too deeply through the set. Understood, Thank understood. You. We'll absolutely look through that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. T, did you have any, anything further? Uh, not at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Weber? Yes, thank you. Um, I am just going to reiterate. <laughs> Sorry, name and address of the record. Apologize. Oh, Nicole Weber, 14 Ryder Street. Thank you. Um, so I am just trying to figure out like, okay, I want to bring up middle schoolers again. It's a middle school corridor and I'm still seeing, um, some nuances. I know Brian is going to kick me for this one, but I mean, it's just like the, the timing of the middle schoolers going to school and the timing of people leaving for work. That still is a sticking point for me as far as state safety. And I want that to be part considered within the project. Um, and as far as monitoring parking, this is a question for Arlington. Would a neighborhood like this be able to create parking permits for the residents on Ryder and, um, and the other streets around that are impacted by this kind of uh, a development. And so the 
the the management of parking would be more visible. So that's the question. That's the second question. And what happens if Again, Alex, I think brought this up, like what is the points of recalibration if something does not go according to plan? Taking your second question first, um, in regards to um, the town and park, resident parking. Um, I don't know, Ms. Lanham, I don't know if you have any sense of this from the planning perspective. I do not, but I do know that um, the Transportation Advisory Committee is taking a look at this based on the information that we sent them last week, Friday. And so I'm happy to reach out to Dan to see if there, if he has any additional information about parking permits for like site-specific site parking permits. Mm -hmm. Certainly, if it's a, if it's a private way, I'm, can private residents put up their own no parking signs on a private way? And are they allowed to um, <clears throat> essentially make their own, have their own permits for their vehicles? I mean, again, if, it, if it's a public way, it really comes down to the select board. If it's a private way, I really just want to defer to Dan, Daniel Amsutz on this. Um, okay. If I could jump in, um, yeah. where the town owns the that side of the private way, uh, the nine the, uh, odd side, that would be up to the town uh, okay. to make a determination. Mr. Chairman, uh, I just wanted to point out that Ms. O'Connor has submitted a letter, I think, on this very subject. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say that whenever this subject has come up, it's always curved back to the town. Uh, mm -hmm. The town has a lot of discretion as to what to do here. Presumably, uh, the select board is the one that's responsible for parking. And uh, uh, and there's a whole lot of problems on the other side and we haven't really heard anything from the town as to what it is they might be willing to do or should do or how it relates to policy uh, in terms of, of resolving resolving those issues. So to some extent, we've been going back to the applicant to look to solve problems that are in the first instance, I think problems of the town. And it would be very helpful if the town would, would you know, say, well, we're, th we're there too. And both from a policy and a property point of view, and we shouldn't be uh, isolated, from, isolated from it. We should be part of the solution. And I, I would hope that we could figure out a way of at least initiating that conversation and getting the the town the town engaged uh, because basically the town has more leverage than anyone else to, to solve the problem. Steve Rubelock, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a question for Mr. Hanlon. When you say the town, are you referring to the select board specifically, or uh, I'm just just for my own clarity, which groups within the uh, within the town? It's it's my understanding that the sort of quote, legislative, unquote, authority over parking rests with the select board, but the select board never really does anything entirely on its own. And there's the entire town structure that reports to Mr. Chapdelaine that uh, uh, somewhere in there, and I'm not completely clear with who it is who does that support work, but somewhere in there are other people who have to take a look and provide advice to the uh, select board. And I assume that those people um, those, those were included in my reference to the town a few moments ago. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, Chairman Klein, can I respond? So I did, after the previous, yeah. uh, Ms. Lima first, please. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that I believe the Transportation Advisory Committee does the, provide that guidance to the select board. So again, I have an email drafted to Daniel Amstutz. He's our departmental liaison with that committee. And um, I, We'll raise this issue with them as well. Thank you. Ms. O'Connor? Yes, um, with respect to the first point that Ms. Weber raised, um, based upon the information that the applicant has provided, we are substantially increasing um, the Ryder Street connector exit uh, with su significant safety features. Um, the issues with respect to the traffic, um, uh, the issues with respect to speeding uh, cars are primarily from the northern uh, side of Ryder Street, not within the applicant's control. Mr. Hanlon referenced that. And I want to 
remind the board, as they know, there's no overall increase during the peak hours of traffic coming out of Ryder Street. Yeah. Um, and so, Mr. Connor, it would be possible to um, include information for incoming tenants in regards to uh, the nature of the use of Ryder Street and the the fact that it is a pedestrian way on the way and, and on a, a safe route to schools and that the tenants need to be careful of that. Certainly. Absolutely. And that after the after the prior hearing um, and some of the comments, I did reach out to um, to Michael Rademacher, who's the director of public works, um, and provided him with the contact information for uh, for Alex T to discuss uh, some of the concerns that the neighbors had raised the prior hearing in regards to the DPW relocation into this neighborhood. Um, and also reached out to uh, Charlotte Milan, who is the uh, the recycling coordinator for the town, um, specifically to try to set up a meeting with, with neighborhood residents about how to handle the uh, the town's recycling days, um, because there was some concerns raised about that at the prior hearing, um, and the, the increased traffic load on a weekend in the neighborhood. And um, I did also reach out to uh, town manager Adam Chapelain for last hearing. Um, I need to double back with him as well, um, specifically in regards to pedestrian safety between where uh, this property comes out onto Ryder Street and the bike path and the lack of uh, sidewalk connection along there, along the La Licata property and the town's property um, and the property that seems to be assumed by the by the landscape company across the, the end of the street. So um, I can I will make a note to follow up again with um, with Mr. Chapdelaine about that. Um, and then the, the third question that, that Ms. Weber had was in regards to the, sort of the, the question about recalibrations and what do we do if the property is open and parking is an issue. Um, and I would imagine that um, the management company would have some ability to uh, to manage the spaces, to try to ameliorate uh, any sort of parking difficulties that are arising as things continue along. Um, Ms. O'Connor, would that be your assumption as well? I would say yes. Daniel, you concur? I do, and, and I think the most meaningful impact would be people parking on Ryder Street, and we already have a mechanism to address that, I believe. But uh, again, I think our the interests are aligned in that we're not going to manage something that uh, is, is causing problems uh, for us or the neighborhood, because then it's not going to... Uh, be a well-managed facility where people want to come and live and and uh, meet the um, the conditions that we represent that we can offer them. So, thank you, Ms. Weber. Did you have anything further? Um, not at this time. Thank you for reaching out to all the people that need to know about this. And I think it's a more Arlington issue than this property's issue. And I think this property has stepped up to talk to the residents um, throughout the process. And I really am thankful for that. It's just, we need to work on the street. It's not a safe place to be, so. Thank you, Nicole. We'll continue Thank to you. work with you. Um, Ms. Contreras? Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm um, Maria Contreras, still live at Two Rider Street in Arlington. Um, I, I tried to review earlier today all the documents that were for today's meeting, and I'm noting that I guess there are some additional ones dated 6-1, so it's a little difficult to know what's covered in those um, new documents. Um, but for a number of months, I, I feel like I've been a broken record about understanding the um, construction timeline and how construction vehicles are going to access the site. Um, I think that this has not been addressed at all. Um, and I would really appreciate hearing in a public forum like how construction is going to occur. 
I, I don't even know how a work bar stays in business <laughs> um, while construction is happening. So, um, so that's first, my first question is regarding construction. Um, I would really appreciate a discussion on that. Um, second, I, I have a question. So I, I appreciate that many, many consultants have been um, conferred to address many of the concerns um, and the applicant has worked with those. I'm, I'm very curious because this is, this is being kind of advertised as a cyclist and pedestrian um, forward um, development, like what entities or what consultants have been used to understand the best practices for pedestrian and cyclist safety for this particular site that is um, intersecting with multiple dangerous roadways. So I, I would appreciate knowing what, who, what consultants have been used and what their recommendations for best practices are and where on the scale of not best practices to best practices, um, the proposed design um, is. Um, and then third, uh, a bit of a small detail, the, I mean, we posted a sign along our part of uh, our property so that fire trucks and safety vehicles can get through. We, we try to make people not park in front of um, the, the garden bed outside our house because of that access. And so last meeting, the drawings for the access for the emergency vehicles um, was very helpful. Um, I'm curious, I've been looking a lot at um, the, the egress from the property onto Ryder Street and noticing that right now at present, the Lalikata um, use of those two um, gate openings you know, we recognize that the trucks going in and out of there currently, I realize that site may be developed um, fairly soon, but at, at present, the oh, trucks going out of there need, usually have trailers, um, very large, and also need a, a pretty wide turning radius. And I'm curious, again, those four spaces along, um, the, uh, along the mill street, I'm concerned about them. I think they're going to encourage um, drivers who are seeking space, guest spaces to, you know, not be able to park there and venture on to Ryder and Pierce and loop back around on Beck and, and Ryder. Um, and, and then they also seem problematic for the current um, abutting property to make the uh, egress. So I, I am curious about what's been done to make sure that those spaces are actually legitimate spaces. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess to address those in reverse order, uh, from a site planning perspective, um, has it been considered how the, the trucks moving out of those gates onto the, the egress way from the, the property? Is, is there enough uh, turning space? Space with the gates open for vehicles to move out without having to drive over the landscape on the opposite side. <clears throat> Randy, I defer to the one that. So oh, I, I guess are, are we talking about the uh, the driveway that exits onto Ryder Street? Yeah. Making making that left maneuver. Um, well, I think starting from so there's the the La Licata property that abuts the where the part the, the parking side of that of that lane sure. leading out to Ryder. Yeah. So with the gates open, is there sufficient space for vehicles to maneuver from there out into the roadway heading out to Ryder Street? There is, yes. We, we have modeled those, uh, those vehicles that have trailers on them to, to ensure that there's no conflicts with those, uh, with those four parking spaces and there is sufficient width for those vehicles to maneuver out of the Lalikata uh, property. Okay. And that includes the, the gates themselves? Correct, okay. yes. Okay. And then um, go back in terms of the pedestrian and cyclist safety, um, so what guidance or consultants was used in the development of the, um, the bicycle and uh, pedestrian amenities? Oh. Uh, we use Niche Engineering, one of the leading uh, traffic uh, consultants in Massachusetts. 
uh, Mr. Zamolka, and I believe Mr. Revelak commented uh, in a positive way based on the um, uh, bicycle pedestrian safety issues on ride on the rider connector as well, a couple of meetings ago. I would also say our architects have done a number of the projects of late where uh, bicycle um, parking and repair and maintenance and interior storage are an important feature. And that was one of the things that drew us to them. One of the many, they're very capable in many ways. And um, so uh, they, they've been a, a great help in kind of the space needs and the um, practical requirements that are, that are related to that. Thank you. And then um, in regards to the first question was to understand more about construction. Um, so- Mr. Chair, may I please oh. have a follow up question on a second? Yes, please, Ms. Contreras. Um, so I'm, I'm, has anyone who, representing Arlington, Arlington has a, a bicycle safety committee. Have they been introduced to this process? I tried emailing them earlier on to make sure that they're aware of this is, um, adding a, a potentially 180 plus cyclists um, to a congested roadway. I'm, I'm just, I'm very curious what local action, um, hyper local action has, um, what conversations have, have taken place in terms of this site in this town. Um, because I, honestly, all I see are a couple of sharrows and one of those sharrows is going the wrong way in a one way. And that is concerning to me. As, some, as a community member. Um, I'm also curious um, how many visitors they hope to draw to that one-way street um, to view the mill stream um, from the larger community. That's also just a, a data point that I'm, I'm very curious about and how, you know, how we're ensuring those, um, lar the, the larger community who's being you know, drawn to the site um, how we're keeping them safe uh, outside of a sharrow going the wrong direction on a one-way street. Thank you. Uh, I guess, Ms. O'Connor, um, is there an expectation of uh, people from outside the project coming to this site more sort of in a, um, to sort of to be a part of the, part of the, you know, sort of the ambiance of the space, but not being residents? Yes, but that's the master plan. Um, the, some of the themes in the master plan, how many people, we have mm -hmm. no idea. I don't think we're talking droves, but we couldn't put a number on it. I, I'd be guessing, we'd be guessing. Okay. Um, and, uh, Ms. Lyman, I don't know if you have a sense, does, do you know how the, the Bicycle Advisory Committee is, is used in town? I don't know very much about them. So I, again, Daniel Amsutz, he's also uh, so he's our senior transportation planner in the Department of Planning and Community Development. Um, so he works both with the Transportation Advisory Committee and then also the Arlington Bicycle Advisory Committee. So he is fully aware of this project. Um, again, in my email to him, I'll also mention the bicycle concerns. But, um, you know, we are, I, I think, as I mentioned in the last meeting, we are also doing the bikeway study and that RFP is out right now. So, um, and we have just completed the sustainable transportation plan, which is about looking at um, various modes of transportation throughout the town um, and improving safety and sustainability for all modes of transportation. So those are both um, plans that are working in parallel and Daniel is the individual in our department who is working on both of those. Okay. If you could, if you could mention to him specifically the the question about the the sort of the two direction sharrows on a one way street and whether that's whether that um, sure. you know, brings up any any specific concerns either from him or from um, from the bicycle advisory group. I will do so. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so the the applicant did provide a um, a construction management plan overview, and I wasn't sure who would want to. Uh, if I put that up on the screen, who would want to present that? That's that would be me. Oh, sure. oh, we'll do that. Okay. All right. Let me go ahead and share this. Okay. So if you would like to go ahead and break through this. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Klein, and, and thank you, members of the board, for allowing us to present this tonight. Uh, I'm Paul Boucher. I'm with uh, Jones Lang LaSalle, uh, the owner's project manager, uh, working for uh, Daniel St. Clair and Julia Myrak. Um, so this is meant to be a, a pretty broad brush overview of a more detailed plan that we will develop, <clears throat> excuse me, and submit to the town when we use file for our building permits. So what I tried to put together here was just um, the major components of, of the plan itself, talking about construction and access, project duration, et cetera. Um, so I'll try to be as brief as possible. We can, we'll take questions at the end. Um, so uh, starting with construction access, um, we have, uh, there'll be three major points of vehicular access uh, throughout the duration of the project. Uh, forest to rider, or I should say Mass Ave Forest to rider, uh, the Mass Ave connector driveway, uh, sometimes referred to as the West driveway, uh, and then off of uh, Mass Ave to Quinn Road, to the Quinn Road connector. Thank you. This is the, this is the appropriate slide. Uh, so the blue arrows uh, indicate vehicular access south of the Millbrook, and then the white arrows are, are vehicular access to the north side of the Millbrook. Um, the two orange squares are construction and access gates. Uh, in this, in this yes. particular slide, oh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, this particular slide also shows the red, um, red boundary is actually a fence uh, that will be set up at, uh, during site mobilization phase. Um, could you go back to the previous slide with the list? Mm -hmm. Or I can maybe just touch on it. So the yeah the next uh, item was just the project duration. Uh, we're looking at a, pl a plus or minus nineteen month duration. We're hoping to get in the ground um, October November of this year and complete in the spring of two thousand twenty three. I'll go through the the major four major phases of the project uh, as we cycle through the slides. Uh, work hours would be consistent with the town noise ordinance, uh, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., Monday through Friday. Site security, I mentioned that we'd be setting up a site perimeter fence. Um, gates would be locked at the end of each day. The fencing location itself uh, may be adjusted from time to time as required by the phases of work. For erosion and sediment control, uh, there'll be detailed um, plans in place when we submit uh, for building permit but basically it's, it's best management practices and sediment control measures for things like the catch basins. Um, there'll be you know, a filter grate um, at the catch basins. There'll be hay bales or hay socks around the perimeter of the, of the site. But again, that'll be more detailed in, in the uh, site civil drawings that are filed for building permit. Um, construction site signage. So we will be putting up wayfinding and directional signs to control the construction vehicle access, um, and it'll also include, you know, directing uh, pedestrians and cyclists safely around the site itself so that there's no confusion about and having someone, you know, possibly wander into the, into the construction site itself. Um, two other items I just wanted to mention. So public uh, notification, the abutter notification, we uh, intend to put out a newsletter monthly, and that'll be sent to the direct abutters by way of email. And we also plan to have periodic meetings to update them on the phases of construction um, and take questions and comments about um, parking issues or, or deliveries and such. And then finally, a contact number would be uh, provided to the direct abutters. It'll be in the newsletter. It'll also be on a site sign, uh, kind of a project sign that will be um, posted on the site fence. Uh, so that it will be visible and accessible to the public. So those are the major components. If you'd like to uh, cycle through the slides, I can quickly touch on, thank you. So existing conditions, we have the, the red boundary is the site, um, the site proper as it is today. Um, we're proposing to place temporary parking to the north of the site on a, on a parcel that's the, the blue kind of parcel that's going in the north-south direction, thank you. Um, that's currently leased by the Myrac uh, family and will um, 
uh, I believe that lease will be continued. So we'll have uh, approximately 48 parking spaces there. The other sec uh, section is uh, it's proposed, thank you. It's uh, between the DeVito um, girl home and the Myrak Hyundai. And um, we, we're proposing that for right now, we're in uh, ongoing discussions um, with the Myrak family to lease that space. Next slide. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is the site access, uh, oh, excuse me, site access slide. Um, happy to get back to that in a few minutes, but basically again, blue arrows, <clears throat> site access to the south, white arrows, site access to the north. Next slide. Uh, in this phase, so phase one is really the demolition and abatement. Um, the buildings uh, one, two, three, and the ancillary structures that are attached to building one will also be uh, abated. Um, the ancillary structures will be demolished during this phase as well. And what is now the parking area behind building one and in that area will be the staging area for construction vehicles and materials. Next slide. This is just showing the uh, phase where we actually demolish building two and replace the bridge, uh, which is denoted by the yellow rectangle in the center of the screen there. Do you have a sense as to how far into the process we, we would be getting to phase two? I would say three months or so in. We're, we're still trying to work on those details at this point. You know, develop a, a complete construction schedule. Phase three is the is the major construction um, at building four and building one and three as well. Uh, so during this phase, buildings one and three would be renovated. Building four would be uh, erected, and the area behind building four, as you can see, it's in the, the green section there. That's uh, that'll be graded and. The swale during this phase will be diverted uh, from where it is today to this, this new um, swale area behind building four. Great, thank you. Uh, phase four is just adding building two essentially. So in, in some ways we're trying to work our way out of the site, right? So we have access uh, on the north side and we're sort of pulling our way towards the south. Building two is the last one that will be erected and then if you change the slide, we have the, um, this is the, the signage and striping plan. And I just try to put some bullet points on the side here, um, designating no parking areas. Uh, these are all in response to uh, questions and comments that were, that were uh, shared with us from the, uh, the abutters as well as uh, the town in, in prior public meetings. And then just a final look at the, at the finished product, landscape view of the 124 unit project. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Contreras, I wasn't sure if you had any questions specific to um, the construction plan. Uh, no, I had not. I just, we had had no information about it. And certainly in the few times where surveying trucks have come to the site uh, to do some testing, I guess, in the parking lot, the existing parking lot, it's been extremely disruptive. Um, Again, there's a lot of traffic flow um, of industrial vehicles moving out at between seven and 9 a.m. Um, from Ryder Street. So I would just take seriously just how congested the Ryder and Force intersection is going to be. And, and again, we're not talking about small vehicles. I'm not concerned for like the, the workers working there and parking their vehicles in the designated lots, it's more the, the heavy duty stuff competing with the DPW, uh, the, the landscape con and construction and electrical firms down, our, down on Ryder. 
and at the time when school children are meandering down the road aimlessly. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, Mr. Inessi, I wasn't sure if you had a further question, if your hand is just up from before. Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? I can. Good. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, is the, are any of the buildings that are going to come down, do any of those buildings contain asbestos? Uh, and if they do, what steps are going to be taken uh, to deal with that issue? Uh, and uh, even if they do not contain asbestos, what steps, if any, are going to be taken to deal with the dust, uh, the dust that's going to be generated uh, as a result of the demolishing of the buildings and the construction of the new buildings? And one last question. What thought has been given to my right of way, uh, which again, I reiterated earlier, uh, was 13 feet wide with respect to construction vehicles uh, traversing that right of way. If I could get a response to those mm -hmm. questions, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. Sure. So I can respond now. Um, okay. Yes. Uh, yes, there is asbestos um, in some areas of the building. Um, it's actually been made a part of the public record. Uh, when this PEL and uh, the Chapter 40B um, application were, were submitted. Um, so <clears throat> the buildings will be abated um, in accordance with law and, uh, and best management practices, of course. Uh, they'll be segregated from, you know, essentially you go in and, and you, you set up uh, tenting and you set up segregated areas to control the, the uh, abatement activity. Um, and then you, you haul the materials offsite. Um, and they're accepted at a landfill um, area that we will identify. Uh, as far as dust control goes, once the when the buildings start to come down, uh, the contractors typically, and, and we'll insist that they do this in this case, uh, they, they, they use water to wet down the area. So after the buildings are completely abated and it's safe to take them down, as they're coming down, um, they'll be sprayed oh, with, uh, with water to mitigate the dust. <laughs> And then as, as uh, uh, to your third point about the right of way, um, absolutely need to work with you for that. And uh, you know, we want to be, as Daniel had mentioned, as others, others had mentioned, we want to be good neighbors. Um, we, you know, we, we do need to use that driveway uh, to get to our site. Um, and, but, you know, we can look at different hours of operations and, and ways to, to handle that with you. What's the typical width of the vehicles that uh, would be traversing the right of way? About eight to eight to about nine and a half feet um, is, and that that takes that essentially from anything from a tractor trailer, which is about eight and a half feet, to a crane. Are you trying to have a tractor trailer come down that right of way? Uh, it's it's possible. We don't have all the details as yet, though. I would want to register my objection to that right off the bat, the members of the Zoning Board of Appeal. And the largest vehicle that would whatever. And that's something that might incite me to do something in terms of taking some further action, all right? If a tractor trailer comes down that right away. Um, Mr. Mr. Anessi, if, if somebody was to, when people are, are in the phase of moving in, if there was a, a moving truck, would that be a similar concern of yours? Uh, somebody moving in where? Moving into the finished development after its completion. Uh, well, <laughs> if they're moving in, uh, there are different ways they can come down to the site. They can come down Quinn Road. Uh, if, depending upon the width of the truck, I don't know what the width of a moving truck would be, okay? If the moving truck uh, is not a, uh, a tractor trailer, not an 18 wheeler, okay? Uh, and is able to traverse that right of way safely without hitting any of the Myrock Hyundai vehicles or any vehicles exiting or entering my parking lot, then I certainly would, have, would not have a problem with that. But again, I don't know what the width of a moving truck would be, but I certainly would not have a problem with folks moving into the uh, complex if in fact it, it can be done safely. Okay. Thank you. 
Mr. Boucher wasn't sure if you had anything further. No, I, I think that, you know, as, as it relates to the tractor trailer issue, I mean, I brought, I brought that up as a worst case, right? So we, you know, and, and it would be at a very limited time that we would need to use something of that size. Um, and I'm thinking basically a steel delivery. Um, and, and, you know, they're anywhere from, I think, 43 feet to 53. So there's, you know, 53 is the worst case scenario. Um, so I'd like to just state that for the record. Okay. Have you uh, looked at all as to whether it's possible to move a, um, uh, for, for a large articulated truck like that to navigate from, from the Quinn Street side um, to the construction site? We, we would actually be looking at that as an option as well. I haven't done the turning radiuses or, or turning movements yet, but yeah, we would definitely be looking at that as an option. Mm -hmm. And I think a key litmus test here is the largest apparatus that the uh, town operates in their life safety firefighting equipment has more than enough clearance to come um, down the Mass Ave connector driveway into the site and, and circle back out. Um, we've tested those movements and the fire department has verified that. Thank you, Mr. That's a good point. Mr. Inessi, is there anything further? Bob, is there anything else? No, I'm all set. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Weber? Yeah, I would just um, request that Ryder doesn't receive the, the large vehicle <laughs> excess coming down our street. We have enough already. Um, and where resor resources can be recycled, I would hope that you would do that. Um, there's avenues to do that through Boston Building Resources and other areas. And I would request that the middle school principals would be included as part of the abutters, just to let the middle schoolers know what's happening in their um, migration corridor. Thank you. Appreciate that. Right. And just sort of thinking a little further along those lines, if there were other people in the neighborhood who wanted to be included on that email list, would they be allowed to subscribe to it? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Ms. Contreras? Hi, um, just for a point of information, um, in the seven years that I've worked right at the intersection of Ryder Street and the, along the, the, the intersection um, to the uh, development, um, our house has been hit four times by a tractor trailer truck trying to egress um, the property of the development um, on to take the left onto Ryder. So it's not 100% foolproof. I, I'm glad that safety vehicles, large ones can get through here, but um, our house has, our, our property has received damage to our house and to, to, to other parts of our um, property. So it, this isn't a hundred percent foolproof. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. And as Daniel mentioned before, we would be doing a survey of the uh, budding properties, uh, you know, video survey, photographic survey to make sure that we have a baseline. And I can promise you, if there's a truck coming in, people are going to be real careful about it, because <laughs> because it won't it won't won't be to our benefit to have there be problems that come from that. Right. Um. Uh, yep. Mr. T is here. <laughs> uh, to, I guess uh, one quick question we had is that this past winter, when they were doing a little bit of site excavation, there was a, a very large excavator track vehicle that came down Ryder Street. Uh, and the amount of vibration came, that came from that was really uh, something like I haven't experienced before, even living, living on this street. Um, is, is, there, is, it, is, is it possible to uh, have all kind of tracked vehicles avoid our street? Um, and or monitor the vibrations on our house because some of our foundation is loose stone foundation. Um, so I don't think photographic evidence would be sufficient to account for any damage associated with vibration. 
Yeah, let us look into that, um, the, the vibration monitoring piece with the general contractor. Um, as, as far as um, you know, vehicle access, um, I, what we'll do is, um, obviously we need to speak with the general contractor about that um, and try to mitigate large vehicles as much as possible. However, there is a time where large vehicles will need to go down rider because the bridge will need to be replaced. And so, you know, until the bridge is replaced and, and the roadway is widened, we need to have access to that north side of, of Millbrook. Is, is there any way to access the site other than from the from the Rider Street entrance and you know essentially from where the for the bridge is it possible to access the site from any of the adjacent properties either from um, excuse me from the Lalacata property or uh, from one of the other Myrac properties? I don't know. No. I, don't, I wouldn't want to yeah hazard a guess there. No. Has that has that been investigated? I guess as a question. Well, I mean, with all due respect, those properties are not part of the development and they don't, they're being used for their own going concerns and operations. And so. Um, no, no, I just sort of thinking that some the of the questions shopping. have been asked, but no one has said, sure, you can drive, you can, you can okay. drive over our site. So okay. that, that. Mr. Chair. Yes, please. Hi, this is Peter Mardianos from 17 Back Road. Ah, Okay. Um, if I may chime in, sorry, the, um, I haven't been able to speak for some reason. Every time I'm on this, I can't seem to get my uh, get my hand raised on this. Oh, no. Sorry, but uh, here we go. Um, so just to add into that, what was just said, I, uh, I don't think anybody on Beck Road would agree to that. Um, and any new traffic coming down this way is already uh, a burden in itself. We've got heavy trucking down here daily. Um, but like I've said in the previous meetings, I had helped organize um, getting this whole road repaved down here. And uh, already it's coming up and it's only been a few years. Um, but uh, just to add to that. Um, and then uh, also the other thing was um, at the previous meeting, I'd mentioned that um, I asked the, uh, the applicant if they had any way of being able to identify any of the, um, you know, the tenants being uh, coming down the Beck Road area. Um, I know I've mentioned that, that about like maybe doing something also in the, uh, the raised uh, pavement area um, down by where it meets uh, Ryder. And, uh, but I um, haven't heard anything on that. So I'm curious to know how we're going to be able to identify people that take a right onto Ryder and then make their way down back road when they see the traffic jam. So, um, you know, still waiting to hear on that. And then also um, earlier mentioned in the meeting, the uh, stormwater uh, that was mentioned earlier. I'm just curious on the, the way of the piping on that and the design and how that will be safely drained into uh, the Mill Brook. Certainly. Um, to take the... I guess the, the first question for Mr. St. Clair, in regards to um, you know, having a, a left turn only at the entrance to Ryder Street, uh, what kind of measures um, can, the, can the management take to monitor um, right turning traffic and how do we sort of work to try to prevent that? Well, uh, I think if, if there was a problem with, if there's a noticeable increase in traffic, then I'm sure we'll hear from Peter and others that live on Beck Road. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the folks who live at uh, the property or work at the property will have, um, you know, will be able to identify and know who our tenants are and their vehicles, and we'll be able to figure that out, I think, from an operational perspective. There will be someone at the property to address concerns as they come up. Um, and uh, I, I really don't think there's any reason why someone would drive to go out and take a right on Ryder Street and then a le left on Beck Road, um, in, unless they just want to sightsee. And I, I I don't suppose that's illegal for somebody to do that, but um, but I don't think that there's no indication there's any desire or demand for additional traffic to go in that direction. And certainly if people are parking, um, you know, we've made a, even though I guess legally it might not be something that is uh, 
as, as black and white, but we've certainly made it clear that we will um, be sure that there is uh, action taken on our part if people are, are parking on Ryder or Beck Road, um, and that will be in the leases and will be, you know, we will have the ability to directly monitor that. I see. So um, as I said uh, earlier, though, that there's no way of really being able to identify those people. Um, I see if we see a consistent car over and over, then obviously it's a new car that's something to be, you know, mindful of, but it would be a lot easier um, so that way I'm not, you know, having to police the road every night because we do get new vehicles down here all the time, but, um, it would be really helpful to be able to identify these vehicles because I've seen it in many new developments where people are required to show a parking pass. I'm sure they're supposed to have something. So there should be something that the vehicle could have as an identifying marker. That way I'd be able to say, okay, yep, no, nope, that's clearly one of them. It's got a visible sticker on the front, something. Um, and I think that would be really helpful to us, especially on back road to be able to, you know, see that. Um, and that would lessen, I guess, everyone's workload, if you will. Um, Thank you. Um, the, your other question was in regards to stormwater and I do have the stormwater plan here. Um, if I put this up on the screen, if there's someone who could um, describe what we're seeing. Yeah, I, I can describe it, I guess. And are we talking about just the, the, the new area? Uh, are we talking about the stormwater from the entire site or? Um, I think just sort of addressing how stormwater is you know, it's going, it's making it basically from the surface to where it's going. Okay. I, I mean, essentially, uh, there's a series of um, catch basins and manholes that collect stormwater uh, from the site, including all paved portions of the site. Uh, and they eventually, you know, they go through a series of underground pipes and manholes and eventually discharge to Millbrook. Um, and we've designed it so that uh, there's a, there, there'll be a decrease in runoff rates and volumes when compared to the existing condition, um, because in, in, in the existing condition today, everything does go to Millbrook. So we're just maintaining that, but really improving upon that existing condition um, by, um, uh, by providing a, a more uh, pervious or landscaped areas as part of the development. And then also in the parking garage area, uh, that drainage, does that tie into this? It does. So, right, that just just the open air portion of that parking lot does tie into the storm drain system. And again, it, it does discharge um, to uh, Millbrook. It does. Is there a sand and oil separator piped in? There's a, uh, yes, it is. There, there is a wild, uh, 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 a water quality unit associated with that, um, with that storm water collected from that area, yes. So that is a sand and oil separator then? So the sand and oil separator will be within the interior of the garage, which will then connect to the sewer system. The area that we're talking about is uh, just a, uh, a water quality unit that collects uh, runoff from those seven parking spaces and discharges to Millbrook. Okay, yeah, I just wanna be clear on that only because they, uh, I know that if it's, you know, if it's the drainage for the parking uh, lot, I believe it is supposed to be piped into a sand and oil separator before it ties into any sanitary sewer system. So uh, just a concern we right. have down here. Yep. So. Thank you. I think that answers most of my questions there, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Are there further questions from the public at this time? I think a round going once, going twice. Seeing none. Oh. No, I would just like, thank you. I would just like to offer up my tree in my yard to monitor traffic if need be, to put a video camera and monitor the traffic from there so it wouldn't be on the residents. Thank you. Okay, I will go ahead and close the public comment for this hearing or for the, this session of this hearing. Um, so we certainly have a bunch of, a bunch of comments. I will um, 
work to pull these together uh, and distribute them back to the to the applicant. And there's also some questions I think we have going forward to the town. Um, appreciate uh, Ms. Lanimo typing busily in the background to Daniel to um, to respond to questions in regards to uh, both vehicular and um, and bicycle and pedestrian traffic. And I'll follow back up with the town in regards to um, trying to come up with a way to improve pedestrian safety along Ryder Street. Uh, it certainly sounds um, both once the project is open, but specifically during the construction period that there's definite concerns um, in regards to um, you know, access, access to the construction site that coincides with the, the movement of school children in the morning on Ryder Street. Um, and that's something we should definitely uh, try to include in the construction plan um, how to how to address that and how to how to you know whether that means that the that construction access is you know is not used um, during the this the school commuting hours in the morning and the afternoon um, or whether there's some other uh, form of accommodation we can make and then also um, trying to come up you know I think it'd be good to do some research into trying to determine whether you know it is viable going from I was it's a Quincy Street um, to make the turn into the into the construction site to make sure that that's a viable turn um, to try to limit the limit the use of the straight right away off of Mass Ave. But obviously, um, that straight right away off of Mass Ave will be the you know the most convenient, most direct excuse me path for uh, for loads coming down on, into the construction site during that construction period. Um, there, were there other, were there any other comments from the board, of Re Mr. Revelack? Yeah, and I, I, I empathize with the concern over construction vehicle vibration. Uh, last summer, the town redid sidewalks on my street, which is, I mean, it's clearly a much smaller project. But, you know, during the couple of, during the period of weeks and probably a period of a few months where this took place, um, you know, just to put in a sidewalk, you need tracked vehicles and excavators and 10 yard dump trucks. And, you know, when they go by, you feel it. Um, and working at home every day, I, I, I kind of, um, you know, I had the opportunity to feel it. But, um, yeah, it, it, it is the downside of construction and it is inconvenient. But, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just, you know, offer some empathies there. It's, yeah, you know, my if it if it makes any if it provides any help, my my house survived the vibrations just fine. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon, um, <clears throat> I'd just like to thank everybody concerned tonight for the constructive uh, for the constructive conversation. Uh, it is true that that we're just really in some ways starting on the actual plan of construction. Uh, and I would like to compliment the, uh, the applicant really for devising a plan that involves the residents and other interested people in the community on a regular basis going forward, because there isn't any way to resolve this once and for all by decisions taken at the beginning. It will require a constant cooperation for, in order to be able to see things that are going wrong and to get them fixed and to make sure that uh, that it all works well. Uh, and I, I thought that the plan that uh, uh, Mr. Boucher uh, outlined in that regard was, was a model and I, I wish we saw something like that more often. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Um, Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, I have a, a, a question and a comment. Um, and and it, it has to do with, um, you know, guest parking. I get that it's a challenge for both sides, you know, the neighborhood um, and the owner. And, and I wanted to, I'll start with a question and then I'll get with maybe a suggestion or a, a comment. Um, how many guest parking spots are there on the property right now? Six. What's the There'll be six. 
six. For overnight guest parking. Overnight guest parking, thanks. So I was looking at the plan, the first floor plan dated last June, I believe. And, and I'm wondering if there's been any consideration given to um, make the first 10 spots as you enter enter the parking garage guest parking. So I've seen it on, on a bunch of other plans where um, you make part of the underground or not the underground, but the covered parking guest parking. And I get that it would require moving the card reader inboard as opposed to right at the gate. But, it, it, and, and I also understand that it's gonna take, could take away some of the, you know, parking that you already have accounted for. Um, but given the challenges associated with guest parking and the control of trying to control the guest parking, I, I, I feel like um, it would be worth uh, considering trying to do that. So there's so two questions, and perhaps it's for Mr. Bar uh, Bargman or um, uh, is that is it possible or has it been considered to consider the first 10 spots uh, un, um, as you enter the garage for guest parking? And um, my second comment would be in order to try to help close the divide on or make up the difference rather for giving up some of these guest parking spots, giving up some of the permanent parking spots as guest parking spots. Um, maximizing the number of compact spots. I think uh, Ms. O'Connor mentioned that, you know, right now you're below the uh, threshold on, on how many get, uh, compacts that you're using, making more compact parking spots. And I know that's, I mean, nobody wants to park in a compact spot. I get it. That's more of a burden on the residents, but it, it may kind of, um, it, it would provide some of that parking. And, and in order to look at the plan, the plan that you might want to reference is A004, first floor plan. This is Joel Bargman. I can answer the second question that the adding additional compact spaces wouldn't add additional parking spaces to the plan because the parking spaces for the most part work between the column grid of the garage and so if you pick up a foot or so for a compact space, it's negated once you hit the column because you can, it's not cumulative across the garage. So I will say that we've netted out the maximum number of spaces in the garage uh, with the current layout and additional compacts would not increase the count. Um, um, Mr. Bargman, in response to that, I would imagine that the columns probably are not uh, fixed yet and could could adjust um, without too much impact. Well, to get an additional space out of a compact space, you need a run of eight. So um, you, you have to take one foot out of eight spaces to get an additional. So that would mean that you have a 64 foot column span which would be far in excess of what you could do with this type of construction. Um, I disagree, but because you can, that, that's, uh, I'm a structural engineer, so I, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm certain that you could come up with a column layout that works with a compact spacing. I'm not, I guess I'm not here to argue, argue that. I'm, I'm, I'm simply trying to uh, help or ask, if these have been considered to try to solve solve some of the primary one of the one of the one of the challenges rather on this site, well, Mr. Ford, I think that um, we we did address that when we went to the police department because there's six guest parking overnight guest parking spaces and there are we have determined there are eight on Mass Ave that the town will permit us to use, so that's. 14, and that's well in excess based on the data we have from the other sites that are necessary for overnight guest parking. Fair enough, uh, Ms. O'Connor, but, but, but uh, unless I've totally misheard some of the uh, concerns by the neighbors is that guest parking is gonna be an issue. 
particularly it's going to land on their street. And a whole lot of discussion has, has happened about can we um, uh, have toes uh, on, that, on that adjacent street? And I'm sorry if I don't remember the name of that street, but, but the, there is an issue of guest parking. So whether, you, whether I'm, not, I'm not saying you haven't complied with the rules. I mean, you guys have done a great job. I'll, I'll just, I'll give, it, give you that. I'm simply trying to address the challenge and, and I'm looking at the parking plan under your building and, and thinking, you know, has it been considered to, you know, in, in order to try to maybe uh, relieve some of the, the anxiety around the guest parking and put more of the control of the guest parking under your own roof, literally and figuratively, you know, consider maybe making those first 10 spots that are dark in the dark shaded areas, guest parking. And that would require moving the key card inboard um, and you would lose it. I, I get it, but it might help solve some of the neighbor's concerns. I just want to clarify that there's, there's six spaces during the weekdays in the middle of the day. And that's the, the guest and all of our monitoring of other projects that have guests, the guest visits are, are very short during that time of day. They're, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, almost never more than an hour. And so we have more than enough spaces then. At night, we have 18 spaces and on the weekends we have 28. So we're not talking about six spaces for overnight. Now, you, you raise an interesting comment about taking the guests into the garage. I, I don't know, my, my I've thought about it a bit before just responding, but it seems to me that if guest parking is there, you're, they're less likely to drive into a garage. They're more likely to park in, to, in a uh, surface space, and we have surface spaces for that, but we're not designating whether guest spaces are just surface or just in the garage. The guest spaces have to be um, registered with the, um, the operating company. So the project manager. So the project manager will determine at that point in time where that space is best utilized. So, um, and we have full control over the parking on our site that's not under the building and in the building. So we have greatest, the greatest flexibility. People are not gonna be allowed just to drive up, park and walk and go look at the Mill Brook or whatever if, unless they have registered to be um, a guest um, at the residence. It's a pri private property and it's not a free parking lot. Any further, Mr. Ford? No, thanks. Thank you. Okay. So for the for the board, so our next steps on this project, um, I think we are. There are definitely details that we still want to want to work out, and, and that we need to work our way through. Um, and there are definitely some things that I think we will that are more likely to be registered as um, sort of conditions going forward, rather than specifically as um, things that we. We necessarily need to have resolved before we um, before we close the hearing. Um, we are we do have outstanding comments coming in still from the town, um, and obviously we still need some time to to review through this package. Um, my my recommendation to us is that we um, at, at the end of the hearing this evening that we continue um, until the fifteenth of June to give ourselves time to sort of come to sort of resolution on a couple of things and to uh, finish have a chance to review the documents and submit any further questions we may have um, to the applicant. With that in mind, are there specific questions and concerns that either the board wishes to raise at this time or that, that Beta would like to raise at this time or if there are specific things that the applicant um, is looking for specific direction on um, 
that they would like us to pay attention to the next meeting. Anything? Mr. Chairman. Um, just Pat. So that's Mr. Anything particular that he thinks we should put some focus in on as well? Um, yeah, I was thinking that the, the one thing that I would, I don't have that. So in a way, I may be out of order. But what, as the applicant thinks of the things that they do want to address, I would like to encourage them to address them at least three days before the next hearing. Uh, because there's just a limit to the amount that we can absorb in a couple of hours, which is what we did tonight. Um, and we're getting near the end and we just, we just need the time to be able to see what you're doing. And, and it would be helpful if you could focus your, our attention on the things that are most important and uh, so that we at least have a, a leg up on, on being able to uh, uh, get, down to the down to the wire uh, quite soon. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Mr. Haverty, did you have any anything in particular you thought we should address or focus on? No, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, well, unless there's anything else, I think would take a motion to continue. Mr. Chairman. Hanlon? I move that uh, this proceeding be continued to a date certain of June 15th to begin at 7.30. 7.30 p.m.? Yes. Second. Thank you. The motion before us is to continue this hearing to Tuesday, June 15th, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. Um, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mills, my <clears throat> Mr. Ravlack? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are continued on 1165R Mass App. Thank you all very much. Thank you as well. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Chairman Klein, um, if I may just add, we, we do not know yet at this point if we will be in person on the 15th. Oh. That's so a that very good point just something to be aware of. We're still awaiting state guidance, but at this point, it seems like as of the 15th meetings will be in person. Thank you for that. Yes, the, there are three bills currently in front of the, the state. Um, the House and the Senate both have uh, bills looking to come up with a plan. And then Governor Baker has basically put in legislation, I think, seeking to extend the current period to give the, the other bodies an opportunity to actually complete their work. So hopefully that will, we'll be hearing from, from the, the state on those. But otherwise, if barring that, as Ms. Lanema said, on, by June 15th, we are supposed to be fully in person. Or at least back under the, the original guidance, uh, the original rules for open meeting. So I'll have to figure that one out. Um, so this brings us back to item number two on our docket, which is the final vote on the decision for 34 Marathon Street, um, docket number 3655. This was one where we took the preliminary vote um, at a prior hearing. Uh, we have before us the um, decision written by Mr. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I know that it had gone around and there were a few comments. Mr. Hanlon was, uh, has completed and put into the record um, ahead of this meeting. Are there any further questions or comments in regards to that decision? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the decision for 
34 Marathon Street. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Hanlon. So moved. Thank you. Second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So that is approval of the decision for 34 Marathon Street. Um, and then before we adjourn, just to review the upcoming meeting meetings and milestones before the board. Um, so our next hearing will be Thursday, June 10th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, still resume, which is a continuance of Thorndike, uh, Thorndike Place. Uh, following that, our next meeting would be Tuesday, June 15th at 7.30 p.m. Um, that'll be a continuance of 83 Palmer Street and also now a continuance of 1165R Massachusetts Avenue. And as we discussed, it may be over Zoom, um, it may be in person, it may be some hybrid of the two, we're not quite sure. Um, then after that, um, Thursday, June 24th, uh, we don't have anything scheduled for that date yet, but that would be the next logical date for uh, the hearing on Thorndike Place, should it continue. Um, so if we could just pencil that in on our calendars. Um, and then we have beyond that, we just have the two milestone dates, Friday, June 25th is the close of the public hearing for Thorndike Place. And July 2nd is the close of the public hearing on 1165R Massachusetts Avenue. And that is all the dates I have for us at the moment. So with that, um, thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. Especially wish to thank Rick Valarelli, Vincent Lee, and Kelly Lanema for all their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording is to ensure that creation of an accurate record of the proceedings is our understanding. The recording made by ACMI will be made available on demand at acmi.tv. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the ZBA website. Unless there's anything further, I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Thank you. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Let Thank you all day. very much. Thank you. For everything Thank this you evening. All. Got a lot of good reading in front of us. And for those of you on town meeting, we'll see you tomorrow night. We'll see you tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs> How much fun can you have? <laughs> <laughs> said that after far too many meetings. <laughs> hey, we can always meet on Saturdays for town meeting. <laughs> there we go. It's been proposed. There we go. <laughs> Mr. Mills, do not push your luck, please. No. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be from the back of Val's boat. <laughs> All, right, good night. All right, good night. All right, good night, everybody. Good night, guys. Good evening. All right, have a good night, everybody. Right. Take care.